Hello, I'm Dave Pollard from Bowen and Transition, and this is part two of a two-part series on the basics of home energy conservation. In part one, which you'll find a link to down below this video, we interviewed Rod Marsh and talked about insulation and the energy audit process and a whole bunch of other basics about energy conservation, comfort and health considerations. And in part two today, we're going to talk with Jay Mather about baseboard and space heaters, heat pumps, solar heating, how to improve your home's air quality, and a bunch of other interesting subjects. So let's get started. Hi Jay, I'm going to start by asking you about your favorite subject, which is the horror of baseboard heaters and space heaters. So if I've got those, what can I do to replace them, supplement them, and reduce the loss of heat from them? Mm. Yes, uh, baseboards, they're, they're an interesting challenge. Um, they're quite prominent because they're cheap. Uh, in the end of the day, if you're going to install a heating system in a new building, uh, a baseboard is the simplest and cheapest methodology used, which is why they are becoming more and more common in average homes. Um, the big challenge with baseboards is they are inefficient. Um, they convert electricity into heat quite efficiently, but they create heat in a way that's very inefficient in a space. Most baseboard heaters are installed by oh, windows, for instance, and uh, the vast majority of the heat ends up going up into a very narrow band along uh, the wall or the window, and a lot of it ends up being lost through the poorly insulated wall or the window itself. And then it pools at a single spot in the ceiling and generally doesn't distribute very well. Um, so that's the inherent challenge in, in many countries in the world. Um, for instance, in Europe, baseboard is now illegal because it is so inefficient. Um, wow. And so when you have it, it's a challenge. Um, if you're going to be replacing baseboard with another distribution system, it's a lot of work and usually a lot of cost. Uh, and so most people don't really do that unless uh, they're having major, major challenges with their heating costs or they're doing a major renovation. It, if you happen to be tearing a bunch of things out, then that's the time to do a lot of interesting things. This is not only just heating, but uh, you can improve your insulation and all the rest. Um, one of the big things um, that people are often doing in retrofits is they're leaving the baseboard heating in. It ends up becoming a backup system, and then they install another system, which becomes the primary. Um, and also, houses often are designed so that their heating system can meet the coldest day of the year demand. The reality is that throughout 97% of the year, you, you don't need that much heat. And so you often have systems that are sized for delivery at a time, which is quite rare. Um, and in those circumstances, you can imagine if you're installing a new system, be it under floor heating, or if you're installing air, air source heat pump or some other form of heating in the house, you could actually undersize it. You could size it for 85% of the year and use your baseboards just to lift it up that little bit or 90% of the year. There's, so there's a number of different ways you can do things. Um, and the big, um, <clears throat> the big opportunities with, with existing baseboard technology is you could take it and replace the actual cassette unit on the floor with a fan assisted baseboard heating, which actually blows air around. The other also you can do is you can stick a fan in the room. You can put these stratification fans on the ceiling and just move that heat around, get that baseboard doing its job. One of the issues on Bowen Island is mold. And I understand that there is a lowest safe temperature for setting your thermostat if you want to avoid it. And there are ways in which you can prevent and detect mold What's the right setting if you're going away on a winter vacation and what else should we be looking out for? Well, mold grows when you have the right comb combination of temperature and humidity. Um, and as the temperature drops and the humidity increases, you end up creating the perfect environment for mold. Um, so typically you want to have your temperature in a space um, above 12, 15 degrees, typically. Um, but this is also dependent on airflow. If you have very, very low airflow, then the temperature may need to be higher in that space to prevent mold from growing. Um, also, the other additional factor is if you dehumidify or if a space is, is low humidity because of your heating system, for instance, if you have a wood stove that tends to, of course, dry the air. So you can actually have a, a mixture of different environments that create the perfect place for mold or a really, really challenging place for mold. Uh, and mold and mildew, which of course is the other side of this, um, are 
quite bad for human health, especially if you have allergies, if you have uh, asthma, if you have any lung issues, it, it can increase your chances of catching a whole raft of different diseases because it challenges your immune system. Um, so obviously people do not want that. And one of the big things um, that becomes quite common, especially in damp environments like we have here on Bowen is where people may have closed closets and the closets are packed full of items and there's no airflow. Um, though even in a heated space, it's very hard for that heat often to get anywhere near that back area. Same thing can happen behind a bookshelf or a, a, on a bookcase that has lots of books on it. And there's no place for air to move. So, so if, if you've got good air circulation in the home, is 13 degrees the magic number or does it depend? It can. It can be, absolutely. But also it depends. If you have a wall that has previously had mold or mildew on it, um, it actually has a much higher chance of growing again. So you need to make sure that that has been properly cleaned and treated or painted. Um, so yeah, you just want to keep the temperature, you know, north of 15 if you want to try to avoid things and keep airflow moving. Um, although in the audits on Bowen, there have been a lot of interesting cases where a room has been well heated and well air flowed. And in one small little corner, there's a spot where it's up 10 degrees and people didn't even know. That's the great thing about the thermal imaging cameras is you can actually poke around and find these spots that may be quite surprising. The thing you need to remember, and, and that was mentioned in the video one, if you're using a thermal imaging camera, the temperature outside needs to be significantly lower than the temperature inside. Uh, because the, the closer those two temperatures get together, the, the less amount of information you can gain from using the thermal imaging camera. Great, thank you. Good. I've been hearing a lot about smart thermostats or learning thermostats. What's your take on them? Yeah, smart thermostats are part of the control upgrade in homes. Um, if you were to grab a, a thermostat that's on the wall of the vast majority of homes, it actually is technically no different from one from 1925. It's the simple mercury switch. It, a little spring system that says, oh, the temperature within these bounds is on or off. It's very, very simple. Now those um, can be quite challenging because in the end of the day, in old houses, thermostats were typically located by the door which meant they're not reading the temperature of the room, they're reading the temperature of that spot by a door. Um, as we start getting smarter with our thermostat placements and learning thermostats, smart thermostats, they can start to understand the space more. They can start to learn what is needed to raise the temperature, how much energy that'll take, how long it will take. Thermostats are now being installed, or at least sensors of the thermostats, in better locations that are distributed throughout a space instead of in locations that are by an area that often is around a corner from where people actually spend their time. So it's, it's a vital piece of the puzzle um, because every home is different. Every heating system has its strengths and weaknesses and smart thermostats can learn how to work with all those variables to increase efficiency, to monitor and model things and, and actually enable you to learn and see uh, over time, if you're uh, interested in information, you can sit and look at the temperature outside, look at degree day differences from the inside of your house. You can start to go, oh wow, when the temperature's five degrees and it's windy, I know it's typically gonna take this much energy to heat my house up. Um, and for some people, that's really interesting. For other people, it isn't. People who don't find that interesting can set smart thermostats to do, to do the job efficiently for the house without you having to think about it. So it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle that's vital. Great, thank you. My appliances, washer, dryer, and dishwasher, they all have these cold, warm, energy-saving settings. Do they really make a difference? Are they worthwhile? Mm, they they can be, absolutely. Um, because obviously the more, most houses actually, even though they have a hot water input into, for instance, many of these appliances, a lot of people don't even hook them up. So it's cold water coming in and then you're washing machine has to pull that temperature up with an electric on-site heating system. And, you know, sometimes that's the case. Uh, at the end of the day, if you wash at lower temperature, you use less energy, provided the system is efficient. Modern washing machines, modern dryers, modern dishwashers that are highly efficient actually use significant amounts less water and they use less energy because they're, they keep everything flowing much more efficiently. Uh, you can actually have condensing dryers now that, uh, that actually manage the system even better. You can have heat recovery systems that actually take the heat off the back of a stove extractor fan and recover it back into the space. You can do the same thing with dryers. So there's a whole range of different ways that can happen. Um, 
We have in North America the Energy Star standard. In Europe, they have uh, an A through G rating. A is the best, G is the worst. Um, and in fact, that's something that Canada is considering doing going forward is to actually have ratings on electrical goods so that people can actually see in average use over a year how many kilowatt hours of energy would this use and how much would that cost to actually use. So you can imagine like it is in Europe now, if you walk into a store to buy a washing machine, you have a sticker that tells you how much it's going to cost to use this thing in a year. And you, that's another factor you can consider when you're buying it, not just its purchasing price. So it's life cycle costs. Uh, that's a vital part of this because people aren't going to put the energy necessarily into doing that sort of research. So the more it becomes prominent, the better it is for everybody. And, and modern equipment is a lot more efficient. Uh, a fridge made in the last 10 years will use an average of 30% of the electricity from a fridge from 30 years ago. So ironically, you have a 30-year-old fridge in your garage outside. It's cheaper to throw that away and get a new fridge. Another new appliance, or relatively new in North America at least, is are solar hot water heaters and instant hot water systems. Yes. I've been told that the solar systems aren't, aren't economic yet mm -hmm. here and that the instant hot water systems are still too expensive to really consider, but mm. are, they are better systems, I understand. Well, instant hot water systems are, imagine where you, wherever you have your tap and where you have, for instance, a shower head, it produces heat, that is needed at that moment for what's required. That's it. So there's no storage tank. There's no energy sitting somewhere and dissipating. And so that, that is actually quite common, once again, in Europe. Um, instant uh, on-site heat delivery is actually a, a much cheaper if you build it into a house because you don't have to run hot water throughout the entire building. You can actually stick just a single cold water supply to every sink and have a hot water tap that heats the water right then and there. So there are savings for installation. Okay. Uh, they so, payback period for solar hot water is typically around 15 years, or solar thermal is the other term for it. Um, which basically, if you're thinking about that, that's 6.5% return on investment. Most people in their um, investments are getting 1.5% to 2% to maybe 3%. So the fact is, you even then, provided you're going to stay in a, in a building for 15 years, you get a higher return off of your roof than you do off of most investments. Uh, which is interesting. Um, when it comes to how solar thermal and solar hot water systems get, ch get cheaper, that will be related to volume. Um, there needs to be a lot more of them installed uh, and there also needs to be more expertise and which speeds up the process. When you stick in a solar hot water system into a house, you need a special hot water tank that has two dual entry. So it, has a, it can receive heat from the solar thermal system as well as whatever the primary heating system for the house is. Um, so those are other factors. Uh, not all buildings can have solar hot water, obviously, if you don't have a roof that's in the right direction or you don't have the ability to have a large thermal store and a large tank, that's another factor. I have heard that the relative humidity in your house should be somewhere between 20% and 60%. Should I buy a thermometer that shows humidity as well? And what do I do if my humidity is below 20 or above 60? If your humidity is um, below 20, you can run into having um, obviously challenges with drying things out, which uh, typically for a human is uncomfort uh, and, and often leads to things like nosebleeds, like people have experienced in cold climates where the humidity level drops quite significantly. Uh, that's usually less of a problem, uh, in, in especially where we are in Bowen. Uh, the chances of us having a, that low humidity are pretty low. Um, when it comes to high humidity, that yeah, can cause a whole bunch of other issues in a, in a home. So uh, that can feed, as we, was mentioned before, the mold and mildew issues. Um, it can also uh, increase the amount of wear and tear on a building, um, and it can decrease the comfort levels. So what it is, is if you're including a, um, a measurement system in your home, like it was mentioned, a thermostat that also measures your humidity levels, it gives you another piece of information. Um, but the other element of that is if, if you live in a high humid environment, I, most people can tell. Uh, one of the simple sense ways to no notice that is just to put your fingers together and feel if it's slick or if there's traction. If it's slick and your hands are clean, then that generally means there's a high humidity. So there, there's different ways of doing it, but uh, sensors aren't that expensive. So do, yeah. do dehumidifiers work? Yes, dehumidifiers definitely do work. Um, and 
in some locations, actually, they, they can become a very important tool, especially if you have an area with low airflow or you've got a high humidity problem in a crawl space or uh, in, in, a, in an attic or something, then they can actually make a huge difference. Uh, you just have to make sure that if you're dehumidifying, that the dehumidifier has the ability to uh, get rid of the water that it's collected. On either you do that manually or there's an automatic system because if you do not have a way of disposing of the water, then your dehumidifier is going to create humidity. All right, uh, next question is about passive house and stage four standards. Mm -hmm. What are they about and are they worth if you're building or converting your house? Are they standards to pay attention to? And don't you run into problems with a house that's too airtight? You can, um, but there are ways of managing that. When houses become more airtight, uh, the management of the airflow becomes more important. This is where heat recovery ventilation is vital. Um, you would not build a passive house without having a managed airflow because of the fact that humidity level would increase within such a high, high thermal insulation and airtight structure. And that's what's being required now in, in Metro Vancouver is that heat recovery ventilation is now uh, a requirement for new buildings. Um, that's really important evolution. What was done recently is um, uh, a student, uh, engineering student from UBC last year did an assessment and if they found that 60% of the heat recovery ventilation systems installed that they looked at in Vancouver were installed incorrectly. Mm -hmm. So we're still early in the stages of people understanding how to do it. The city of Vancouver has now actually set a quality control system and um, uh, a course you have to take in order to install the systems to make sure that people know what they're doing. Um, if you're looking at passive house, which is an incredibly high level of thermal insulation and air tightness, or stage four, these are both much, much improved upon thermal efficiencies. Uh, for new buildings, um, yeah, it absolutely makes sense because the amount of money you're going to save in heating the structure over its lifespan is vast amounts more than the cost for the increase in the structure. Uh, so it's a simple equation. Most houses will exist for anywhere between 45 and 60 years and over that time they're going to use energy and have an impact on the world. When you have a very high level of insulation, that impact is much less. And yes, it costs you money to do that, but you save way, way, way more. And that's why we do that. That's why it's, it's becoming a requirement. Uh, when it comes down to retrofitting, uh, renovation, that is a little bit more challenging. Um, because you can improve the thermal insulation in a building often quite easily, but to get it up to that level requires sometimes a radical renovation requirement. And if that's the case, you could easily be bumping up against, is it worthwhile doing that? Cost effectively, probably not. If you want that level of performance, you might be better off just building a new building. And right. that's the thing you have to balance. Um, certain structures lend themselves really well to retrofitting. Others are very, very complicated. So it depends on the structure. Uh, I know that you have done the same thing that I have, which is replace about 100 light bulbs uh, in your house with LEDs. I did it by buying 10 packs on Amazon, and they actually cost no more than incandescent bulbs when you get them in that way. And I made sure to get the 2700 Kelvin bulbs because mm -hmm. a lot of the... LEDs are very harsh and I like the kind of warm uh, light that you can mm. can more or less see in this room. Uh, and I donated my old bulbs to the Nook. If anybody's going to do that on Bowen Island, the Nook will take your old bulbs. And ended up cutting my lighting cost by about 85% and I know you've done the same mm -hmm. thing. Other ideas on saving lighting costs? Uh, it's about more efficient lighting as well. A lot of spaces um, are poorly lit. Uh, they may have lights that are designed that are over lighting a space. Uh, for instance, many bathrooms and kitchens in modern houses are in, incredibly overlit. Um, and in that case, you can sometimes install, not necessarily replace all the lamps, you may only replace half of them or two thirds of them and still get the light that you need. Uh, nobody needs eight halogen light bulbs above their kitchen sink, <laughs> but yet it's standard because people like to have a brightly lit kitchen. Um, but yes, that if you're using halogen light bulbs, that's going to be 400 watts of power, which is going to cost you about five cents per hour. And you add that up over the year, that's an incredibly painful yeah, yeah. overlit environment. The other thing is it's cooking the top of your head because they're little heaters. 90% <laughs> of the energy goes into heat, not light. So 
you know, that's why we transition to LEDs, where the vast majority of the energy right. goes into light, not heat. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, lighting replacement is, uh, is an obvious place to save money, quick paybacks. Uh, as, as you mentioned, 85% reduction for yourself. For, for me, when I moved into my house, and I'm renting a house, I don't own the house, it was a 16 or 17 month payback period, which in percentages, uh, you're looking at about 78% return on investment. That's yeah. pretty good. All right, suppose I am like Mary Beth and I am thinking about building a new home. What are three things that I should keep top of mind in terms of comfort, health, and effective efficiency? What you want to do is make sure that your insulation is high quality. Um, now, here in British Columbia, we've got some new building codes, building standards, and that are going to make buildings more efficient uh, automatically. Some municipalities are calling for higher standards earlier than others. Um, but uh, as mentioned before, the better the insulation in the building, the lower your cost for operating it. And in since most houses, the significant portion of your cost for operations is going to be heating and growing these days is cooling. Um, then obviously the more you make your building efficient, the better that's going to be. So. Uh, your insulation is, is a major one. The other one is your heat distribution system, however it is you're going to heat your building. If you use baseboard heating, um, you're going to be limited as to how efficient you can make the building. If you're using a heat pump, it gives you more options. Uh, much more efficient between usually around three, three and a half times the efficiency of a baseboard. Plus, an a air source heat pump can also act as a cooling system, so it, it, it doubles up as a secondary system. Um, if you've got a centrally distributed heat system, which may be uh, vents on the floor or under underfloor heating with hot water systems, then you can actually choose different ways to deliver that heat to the building. So as for instance, if heat pumps improve in 10 years phenomenally, you could actually retrofit a better heat pump into that system to distribute the heat. If you have isolated heating in specific locations that isn't connected to a central mechanism, you, you, it's much more complicated than that. So your heating and cooling distribution system is, is becoming more important. The other one obviously is comfort. You want to have a space that is a place you want to be. Air quality. Uh, we've talked about particulates and volatile gases and um, I have a relative humidity gauge in my home thermometer here and I understand that Bowen Island Library now rents radon detectors. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of devices. We've been looking in Bowen on transition at the purple air monitor for particulates and the FUBOT monitor for VOCs, which um, seem to work pretty well and are relatively affordable. Um, what are the other things that we should be looking at or doing to ensure the air quality in our homes is safe? The biggest uh, source of internal air quality issues is actually fire retardants. Um, and this is not so much a factor in older buildings, um, but it is a factor in carpet, it's a factor in furniture, specifically couches. Um, it's been determined in Sweden that the threat from fire retardants in your home, in your furniture, is 85 times higher than the threat from fire to your health. It's really interesting how we've introduced a whole bunch of um, irritants, carcinogens, and other volatile organic compounds into our homes um, without necessarily realizing what the cost of that is. Um, as most people will be no doubt aware, uh, allergy reactions in people today are exploding uh, almost at epidemic levels. Uh, it's the same thing for people who are having breathing issues or asthma. This is obviously correlated to these sort of elements that we're introducing into our homes. Uh, the same exact thing, by the way, can be said about cars. Uh, inside of a brand new car in rush hour traffic is eight times worse air quality than outside the car in the rush hour traffic. Wow. And that's from the things inside the car. So we have to think about all those other elements. The way you deal with that is if you're going to have new current carpet and new furniture, uh, you need to make sure you have a good quality airflow. You need to make sure there's a lot of fresh air in the building. And this is where heat recovery ventilation systems do that. They ensure that there is an exchange of fresh air into the building on a regular basis, on an ongoing basis. That helps you more than anything else to manage that process. 
Uh, the other thing is you need to have distribution of the air. Yeah, you need to move it around because if you do not move the air around, it can sit in pockets in areas or in rooms where you don't get much flow and then that's where these volatile organic compounds can build up. Um, so these are all little elements of the process. Luckily, new buildings come these days, most of them, with heat recovery ventilation systems which are going to help a lot with that area. Um, but if you're going to choose, for instance, a hardwood floor instead of a carpet, modern day, the hardwood floor is a lot safer for you, especially if you use organic stains. If you're going to use uh, furniture that's five years or older, uh, it's going to have a large portion of the really bad chemicals in it already released. So these are other factors wow. to think about. All right, last question then is about heat pumps, which you've mentioned uh, a little bit about. Gabriola Island has installed uh, something like a thousand uh, heat pumps through a community initiative. Until something like that is available here, how can I decide whether I should install a heat pump in my home and what do I do first to decide mm. to get that happening? Absolutely. Um, so a heat pump, just a very quick crash course, um, is basically what your fridge is. Uh, your fridge takes the heat inside of itself through a compressor system to the back of itself through um, a radiator system to get rid of the heat. What a heat pump does in a home is it grabs the heat from somewhere else and brings it into the house. So an air source heat pump uses air as the source of that heat. A ground source or geothermal heat pump uses the ground as that source. And there's also water source heat pumps. Um, and they have varying degrees of efficiency. An air source heat pump average is about three and a half to one, which means for every one kilowatt of electricity you put into it, you get about three and a half kilowatts of heat out of it. Um, and then heat pumps can also be used to cool because they can be reversed. Um, and that's in essence how they work. Um, they become very, very common in a lot of places in the world. Um, if you live in a place that gets incredibly cold, like lower than minus 10, minus 15, an air source heat pump becomes a lot less efficient at those times because there's not that much heat left in the air. Um, but in, in that case, you can actually use a built-in immersion system, which is like a baseboard heater. So then that's the lowest the efficiency, efficiency gets to. Or you could use a ground source geothermal system in those environments and they have the same thermal performance all the time. Um, so that's, that's a heat pump crash course. Um, when it comes to deciding if you want to do that or not, it depends on what you're comparing it with. If you were replacing, for instance, uh, baseboard electric heaters with a heat pump, you could go, oh wow, I could cut my heating cost by 66%, hypothetically. But the thing is, how much money is it going to cost you to install it? Because uh, replacing electric baseboard heaters throughout a big building with a heat pump is a little very complicated. You're either going to have to go with cassette systems that fill an individual room, or you're going to have to stick in some distribution system throughout the whole house. And that could actually push it into a place where the payback period is gigantically long. Um, so you have to balance all those equations. If you happen to have a heat distribution system in the house already, through underfloor heating, hot water, or you have, for instance, an air ducted venting system, um, then actually that can make really good sense. And that means all that hard work for heat distribution is already there. Um, and, and the question about when should you do it? Well, if you're building a new house, you can design this stuff right in, in the very beginning. If you have a gigantic heating bill, you could try to figure out, okay, hypothetically, it's gonna cut my bills by 50%. I'm spending five grand a year on heating. That's two and a half thousand dollar savings. The seat pump's twelve and a half thousand dollars. Okay, five year payback, you can make decisions. Um, now, heat pump costs are still relatively high because there's still not that many installers. Uh, the grant scheme that does exist in BC through BC Hydro is pretty small, a couple of thousand dollars. It's also quite long and cumbersome. It's not an easy process. But the new Clean BC plan is saying they're going to revamp that and make it easier, which would, which would be great. Um, Gabriel Island is a great example because what you had is some locals who got the distribution rights to a heat pump technology on that island only and then they started installing them relatively cheaply because the install price is the thing where a lot of heat pump costs skyrocket and that's why they rolled them out in volume. Uh, Salt Spring Island is also trying the same thing right now. Uh, so it's about trying to find the balancing act. Um, uh, uh, another thing to think about in Canada is we've got a small number of heat pumps available in the market and that's because the Canadian Standards Agency are the ones who charge a gigantic amount of money to get a heat pump certified. So that's holding back the introduction of new innovation into Canada. Um, 
we are obligated under the European Free Trade Agreement to recognize European standards, and I know there are some European heat pump manufacturers who are considering challenging Canada and the European courts because of this issue, um, which would actually be very good for us. It would be good for us to get choice. If you have a heat pump company that has 30 heat pumps and then we've got two available in Canada and they're seven years old, that's not good for us. This isn't about quality, it's just about certification methodologies and there's a lot better ways we can do this. So these are things people have to consider. Skills, speed, and certification methodologies in the grant systems. So they need to all come together to make it work. And when they do, they make really good sense. Um, you're gonna find in a lot of places now in the world, heat pumps is a mandatory standard and you have to actually get special permission to install a not a heat pump. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we should hopefully be going uh, at one, some stage in the hopefully near future. Well, sounds like a good project for us to take on next is to see what we can learn from Gabriola and from Salt Spring and see if we can mm -hmm. do that on Bowen. What's the volume we would need? Do you have any idea? That's it's a good question. Um, the big challenge with what happened on Gabriel is they had the rights to a specific heat pump just for that island, and it didn't threaten any of the other distributors because there were none of those heat pumps installed in Gabriel. So the company gave them the rights because they said, well, if you sell one, that's better than what we've done. But they can't install those anywhere else. So that's a limiting factor. Um, and that's sometimes what you have with some of these distribution companies. They, they have given the rights to certain companies and they're keeping the price at a level. Um, so there's a lot of different ways you could do that. Volume wise, um, the big trick is you need to get people on island who have the install and maintenance skills. That's vital. Um, and once you have that, the rest you can start working on. That's actually the biggest piece because without that, it doesn't matter how good all the rest is. That will be the limiting factor. Um, and, you know, Bowen, for instance, has 1,500 houses. Uh, hypothetically, say, half of them are viable for heat pumps. And hypothetically, a couple percent of those do it every year. That would be enough to make it worthwhile. All right. Thank you to Jay and thank you to Rod for part one. I think we've given you a, quite a whirlwind tour of the opportunities for improving your home comfort, health, and energy efficiency. And as I mentioned in the first part, there will be some links under this video, links to the first video in the series, and also links to, to some information about how you can do follow-up, get an energy audit done, uh, get the thermal imaging camera from the library, um, some other ideas for savings, and some registered contractors on Bowen Island that can help you with the next steps. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed these, this two-part series and look forward to seeing you again on whatever the next project is that Bowen and Transition takes on. Thank you very much.